uh, topic, the first speaker today is Luke Verhoeven, uh, who will speak on fuzzy direct ensembles for the fermion. Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to start this afternoon session of this conference. Um, so I'll be talking about work I've been doing over my PhD, uh, which was under guidance of Masood, and uh, a lot of this was together with Nathan Fadiorli, who is uh, next up. So I'll quickly introduce um, the sort of general picture of what I'm doing and then show you some of the less interesting than I was hoping results, but they were compiled uh, over the weekend. So I did not have time to really upgrade them. So it all starts from uh, fuzzy geometries. The terminology is introduced by uh, John Barrett, as far as I know, um, which are spectral triples of this particular form. Um, and the reason we want to work with these fuzzy geometries is because the space of allowable Dirac operators takes a very nice simple form, it's parameterized by a uh, set of self or skew adjoint matrices, k sub i, for i ranging over subsets of indices. You can make this theorem a little bit more precise, only certain subsets can appear and we know the sign epsilon i depending on the subset. But really the, the goal is we have this finite set of matrices that will tell us everything about our Dirac operator. So um, what we wanna do is we wanna turn these into Dirac ensembles. Basically we want a ensemble of geometries and then try to do things in the direction of quantum gravity by defining partition functions over this space of Dirac operators where we think of the Dirac operator of course as the space of metrics really. So for us, these um, look roughly uh, like this. So we have a probability density of our Dirac operator depending on these matrices as some exponential um, action uh, with the uh, Lebesgue measure on Rn squared to make this a, a nice measure. So in general, this gives us a multi-matrix random matrix model, um, right? We have a bunch of matrices, VK, these Ki, and we select them via some random process. Um, Multi-matrix, random matrix models are very hard, um, which is why we restrict for our first investigations to zero one um, fuzzy geometries where there's only one matrix involved in the Dirac operator. It's always the commutator of some self-adjoint matrix. Um, for these uh, zero one fuzzy geometries, we look at quartic uh, ensembles because they show some of the interesting behavior uh, we want to see without becoming overly uh, complicated. So uh, a quartic uh, ensemble just means we're taking the trace of a quartic polynomial in D and we're keeping it um, symmetric for D to minus D. Um, you can trace this uh, ensemble in terms of H and that gives you a random matrix model essentially. Um, now this random matrix model, while this single matrix has the um, complicating factor that it is multi-trace, uh, which you can see most clearly here in this trace of H times trace of H cubed, and that complicates um, some of the analysis. But we can do some, uh, uh, we can get quite a ways with these models. Um, in particular, for, for these models, there's a lot of interesting work um, mostly by Nathan. I joined this project a little bit later. Uh, later. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do for these models was we wanted to include a fermionic action. Because right now, our uh, action, as you can see here, is entirely in terms of D. And we wanted to add in this uh, fermionic part of the spectral action. So um, we want to uh, add the psi D psi term. And then we restrict to observables just of the metric. So we're not going to look at expectation values of this fermion field yet. Um, largely because if we restrict to just observables in terms of D, what we can do is we can integrate out this fermionic action and it just gives us the determinant of D uh, as a Grassmann integral. Um, so this is not your regular integral, it's a Grassmann integral or Berezin integral and it gives you your determinant of uh, the, the operator D. 
And that allows us essentially, we then take the logarithm of the determinant, pull it into the exponential. Um, basically, we view this added fermion as a change of the action that we use to define the model. But then you need science by God. Yes, I so, yeah, I'm being a little bit vague about what exactly I mean here. Um, but yeah, technically this is psi bar uh, d psi, the inner product is um, the alpha joint linear and the, a joint linear in the first. Um, yeah, this will come up later uh, too. So this is, this is our plan. We want to see what changes if we add in this, uh, this fermionic uh, action. So there is an immediate problem. Um, that is that the determinant of the Dirac operator for the zero one geometry is always zero uh, because it's a commutator, it has a kernel. Um, so the way we fix this is instead of looking at just the zero one fuzzy geometry, we look at the zero one fuzzy geometry um, where we give a mass to the fermion. So we essentially we build an almost fuzzy geometry in the sense of an almost commutative uh, spectral triple we tensor on a finite spectral triple where the Dirac operator uh, is just M. And doing that, we get this bigger uh, spectral triple where you can compute um, the determinant, or in this case, actually the Trophian, um, to be this uh, expression here. So the mass shows up and you can see if the mass is indeed zero, um, you would get zero here. I wanted to highlight uh, the appearance of the mass here because we're doing probability densities, we're dividing um, the density function we have by a normalization factor. So there is a very sensible mass to zero limit because you will have the M to the N in the numerator and the denominator. So uh, talking about a massless model in this context makes total sense. You just do this with a mass and then take mass to zero. Um, here you see also something Masood uh, pointed out. Uh, we're using J psi D psi instead of psi d psi. This is to get the Fafian instead of the determinant, um, which a priori we consider slightly more realistic. This is mostly due to a fermion doubling like phenomenon we get by adding the massive uh, term. We need to double up the fermion space, even though we didn't set out to do this. Um, effectively, treating j psi d psi or psi d psi or even further variations on this is not materially different. So it turns out in the end, we can do this all by changing this one uh, number. Another nice thing about this um, uh, computation of the, the, the rock operator or of the determinant of the rock operator is that it's very similar, especially if the mass would be zero, it's very similar to the Vandermond term you get in random matrix integrals. Um, so indeed, if you take the mass to zero limit, it's really like you're just upgrading your model from a complex to a quaternionic uh, model. It has very similar effects. So our main goal um, throughout this whole story is for these random Dirac models, we want to find what we call the spectral density. That is a function uh, row so that we can compute large n limits of observables um, by just integrating our functions along that density. Um, you can do a bunch of analysis and show that this uh, guy actually exists. Um, we did this and the spectral density uh, in terms of H, so here it's written in terms of D, in terms of H it's slightly different, but if you know the spectrum of H, you can compute the spectrum of D. That's some relatively elementary linear algebra. Um, so if we know the spectral density for H, we've solved our problem. And that turns out to solve this complicated integral equation. Um, if you weren't to add a massive term, what you would get is just this first part, which is very uh, nice and solvable, but the mass interaction adds this, um, well, integral equation term here that makes it self-referential and hard to deal with. Um, a little bit more details about this. So this polynomial P uh, is a polynomial that depends on the action you've put in. So in our case, uh, this is uh, gonna be a linear polynomial most of the time. That's because we put in a quartic and there are some reductions uh, in there. Um, then the important 
or another interesting thing about this is there's this input um, capital sigma that is the support of the spectral density. So determining this support, um, there's a bunch of extra equations, consistency equations that say, for example, your spectral density must have total mass one. Um, conditions like that determine the support. And then once you've determined the support, the density you're actually after satisfies this equation. Solving this analytically is not something we consider quite feasible at the moment, but computers have no problem uh, dealing with this. So we can find the spectral density for H for some for certain values of the uh, coupling constants G4 and G2. I have them plotted here. Um, and one of the interesting phenomena that we see in this model is there's a phase transition where the support of the spectral density splits into two. So we start out with this blue uh, curve here in the middle, which has support between roughly minus, uh, minus a half and plus a half. And then as we lower G2, at some point, the um, support splits apart into this two cut phase. And that is one of the interesting phenomena that we see in the quartic model, but not yet, for example, in a just straight up Gaussian model. Um, I'll skip over the explanations of the coupling constants. They're just parameters of the model that we can change. I'll describe a little bit what they do. Uh, so first stop is how does this picture change uh, when we consider a mass as well? So two pictures here, let me start on the left, which is very similar to the one on the previous slide. So what we've done here is we've plotted the spectral density for fixed G4, fixed G2, so a fixed polynomial, um, but changing mass. So the mass changes from zero, uh, which corresponds to this blue line here, which is right at the phase transition uh, between a single support and split support, um, up to the red line, which is for a mass two. And it, there's this sort of double effect going on, where first, um, well, it's kind of hard to see in this slide, but at first, um, increasing the mass will push your model deeper into the two cut phase, but then as the mass continues to increase, it actually pushes the model back into the single cut phase, uh, which is this red line, which is definitely in the single cut phase. That is because the mass actually shows up, it changes the effective value of the G2 parameter in your model, which largely controls the um, phase transition. So if you correct for that, if you keep the effective uh, second coupling constant uh, fixed, and then change the mass, uh, you see the effect is much less dramatic. Um, okay, so we know roughly the effect that the mass has on these spectral densities. So what are some extra interesting things we can do with this? We can use these spectral densities to estimate things like the dimension um, of our model. So usually you do this by the heat trace, but because we have a bounded model, the heat trace doesn't actually have a singularity, so it looks like it has a singularity, but it's actually just one there. It doesn't blow up. So we need um, secondary uh, estimators for this. The first one we consider is the spectral dimension, and an improved version is the spectral variance. And on the next slide, we'll see. Uh, so classically, these should give you, um, at least as t goes to infinity, these should give you the dimension. Um, but for us, here at the top, you see the spectral dimension, which has this weird blow up behavior, which is caused by zero not being in the spectrum anymore. So the spectrum for a mass M model starts at M, which is why for increasing M, you see this runaway effect to infinity. Um, the spectral variance is an improved version of the spectral dimension, which fixes uh, that behavior. And we get these graphs. So these graphs are not that interesting. It appears to suggest the spectral dimension of maybe one, but it's unclear. Um, at least it does agree very well with Monte Carlo simulations uh, we did of these models. So I want to understand these better. So some short-term goals for me are understand better uh, what this dimension is doing and see if we can get a size for these guys. Um, I want to, so for now we've considered M a coupling constant. I think we can make M a dynamical variable and get predictions for M as well. Um, and what I didn't mention, 
these two uh, are in the two cut phase of the model, and this one is in the one cut phase, and there's little to no difference uh, visible. So I want to see if I can better understand uh, the phase transitions in H, how they affect the phases of D, and if D itself maybe has interesting phase transitions. Um, and I think time-wise, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.